Happy 2021, everyone. Ah, it's here. Okay, so it's going to be our 2020 year in review today. <laughs> On the Wandering But Not Lost podcast and not a day too soon. Thank you, 2021, for getting here safe. Welcome to Wandering But Not Lost, your online source for finding balance so that you can align, connect, and prosper. I'm living right here and now and I don't want to miss out. Is this what life's all about? The world is calling and I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening. And now your hosts, Jen O'Brien and Matt Emerson. Well, welcome to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. This is episode 148. You can find all of our show notes over at WBNLpodcast.com. Channel Brian, we made it through 2020. I feel like we need streamers and stuff. We do more prepared. <laughs> Balloons, I don't know. know. Really, I. you know what? We're not out of the woods yet. I, I had sent you that gif and maybe I'll, or that uh, picture. I'll put it into the show notes of that of that guy being all, he's looking at the watching the countdown clock. Oh, yes. And it gets to 12.59 on 12.31.2020, and then it clicks over to like, the, 13th, the 13th month, <laughs> one, one okay. second into the first month of the 20, still 20. Well, we wanted, to, we wanted to wrap up with a bow our experience of 2020, while also citing a bunch of articles and doing kind of archival, if you will, yep. posts, so that if you ever come across this post, this YouTube video, this anything, you'll have our notes that are curated content for what happened in 2020 and what was the impact that it had on business, on us as vet consumers, on our mental health, on every industry practically. So we're going to talk about that today. And, and what happened to us, a little, some of our uh, anecdotes uh, throughout the year as well. So absolutely. So let's dive into it. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. And you know what, Matt? I think we should just share our notes. Let's just share our notes as we go through. Do it. Can we do it? So we, we have this uh, Google Notes, a uh, Google Doc that we created, and we will... Um, Are you sharing or you want me to share? I want you to share. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't even have it up. Okay, well, there you go. (laughs) I do want another screen. Who's sharing? Okay, that's okay. (laughs) And that way we can make it bigger too, you know. You could do that control plus or command plus. We can, people can actually see it if they're watching. Hey, cool, all right, right on. Okay, so first off in our notes, what we have, and as I've mentioned in a couple other episodes, Matt, I'm going to be putting this on my JanOBrien.com blog. For years, I have done a year in review, and it's just been the highlighted stories. And I always start out with what we got right here, which is I found a couple, Matt. You might find a few. Um, Time always does a year in review, and it's usually like the online version has a lot of photos. It's very cool, but they have a really good video. So we have a link to the video that um, is really well done on the highlight of the stories. There's the Wall Street Journal. Flipboard is pretty a cool. If you never, have you ever used Flipboard? Flipboard yeah. is one of those places that just pulls in content from everywhere. That's kind of cool. There's I thought, that, I thought that was great because it was a lot of different articles. And you could kind of pick and choose the topics that you wanted to go to. You know? mm-hmm. So yeah. that we've given you those in the show notes and uh, for here. Then Google always does a year in search. And their video is actually running as a commercial right now. So there's a link to that. And then their page for the year in search, what was the most, and honestly, the theme of that video is why, why everything was very well done. There's Twitter always does something. So I've got a link in there for Twitter insights and they did a thing called their hashtag is this happened. And that's what people are doing, but it will show you if you're interested, what was the most favorited tweet? What was the most shared tweet, you know, worldwide and all that is in there. There's a couple really good articles in here on social media stats. I was interested in seeing, the differences, the increases between last year and this year for certain platforms, all that's in there. Then, of course, you got to put the celebrity deaths in there, the in memoriam, which I forgot. I forgot about you all. Whenever you look at that, you're like, I forgot that person passed away, you know? Yeah. And especially, yeah, yeah within this last year. Exactly. So we've given you some of our best uh, things that we found. Um, you know, all you have to do is Google it, but it's all right here. It's kind of interesting if you just want to get into the statistics of things and get a, an overview of all of it. So, what were the top major stories? Of, obviously, the COVID 19 pandemic uh, uh, is the very first major story on our list. 
So, you know, what was interesting is Matt started doing the, the research on this last week and I was updating it as of the this recording, which is December, it's right before the new year, right. um, end of the year. Well, yeah, a week before. So this will be a lot higher by the time, you Absolutely, know. Because we're recording this a little bit before um, the actual new year. And but on this was to stats as of 12, 22, 20, because honestly, if you go in there, if we went and checked it like an hour <laughs> later, it would be different. But worldwide cases, over 78 million, 1.71 million deaths as of the time that we stamped these notes. The United States had 18 plus million cases with 322,000 plus deaths as of uh, December 22nd. You know, I was reading an article this morning I thought was interesting that 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 it seems as though there's a little bit of a plateau again, because what we're really experiencing right now is that Thanksgiving uh, mm -hmm. communal, right? We haven't got into what will happen after the the the, uh, the you know Christmas holiday here. That'll hit in the middle of January. But I, it, it dawned on me or, or kind of stunned me a little bit. You know, we were at a point where when it got up to 2,000 deaths per day, it was like, oh my God. And then it became very, very consistent. We're up to 3,400 now. I mean, how it went from 2,000 a day to 34 in less than really a month, month and a half. Yeah, and that's been a spike. couple weeks in a row or at least yeah. 10 days or so of 3,000 yeah. plus deaths. Right. Which Pretty is more incredible. likened to, that's how many people we lost in the one event, 9-11, you know, when you right. think about it and how impactful that was on the nation. And now it's it's, it's interesting because we sort of get numb to it, right? Yeah. You know, people saying, well, is, is it really COVID? It's COVID related. If somebody has an issue and that an underlying issue and they're in the hospital because they have COVID, then it's a COVID related death. It's not that they didn't die because they had a heart attack, you know? Right. They died uh, because they have a heart condition that was accelerated uh, because of complications from COVID. I mean, I just think know. it's, you know, the whole thing is, is fascinating to just kind of watch the, the, you know, this is still, even though it's been around for over a year is still a very new thing, right? And you're learning the nuances of the virus all the time. And then there's that new migrant yeah. form that, you know, is now a student. The new you know, strain, the mutant strain, it's, uh, right. not in, it just spreads faster. Oh, here's yeah. good news. Yeah. You're not going to yeah. get sicker. It just might spread faster. No, by the way, it's probably already in the U.S. That was um, the latest story. Unbelievable. So, but you know, I'll tell you last night, Sweepy and I went out for a, uh, a drive just to kind of get out of the house and to go look at some lights and stuff like that. Because once again, we are filming this a little bit before the holiday. Um, and, uh, it was amazing to be out and, uh, you know, California has really gone over the, at the edge with cases in, you know, in the yeah. last, you know, few months. Well, everywhere has. <laughs> if you look at that map, of the United States, the entire country is red. Um, yeah, that's and, a good uh, point compared to the world where yeah, exactly. we have an image podcast. Yeah. We have an image in our notes and over on YouTube. If you're watching, it's uh, it's the, I've loved this, the Johns Hopkins, um, you know, hot map. And yeah. it's updated all the time. But anyway, uh, yeah, it was fascinating. All of red, pretty much the only one of maybe Brazil is like that too. Yeah. Um, that you, um, uh, you know, there's a lot going on, but there, but a lot of people are staying at home because the traffic and the, we were laughing. It's like, oh my gosh, it's this date, you know, in December, in December. Look at there's nobody out. It was pretty wild. So that was actually kind of kind of reassuring. You know, what I love about this map, General Brian, is that you know, you know, Hawaii is laying out there in the Pacific, but until you see it as a red dot. You don't really exactly know where Hawaii is. And there it is, right there, just as red as red could be. Good old. And then you've got Alaska up there, actually, not as bad, maybe, but. Well, so, that, yeah, because that's the only place people live in Alaska. Exactly. That's a good point. So, <laughs> so the stats, obviously, the vaccines roll out right in December. So we got a link to the CDC and all the information on the vaccine, the two that are out now, Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech. Um, so I think the story that we've been hearing since the beginning, and I certainly have felt this and anything, and I've been talking about it, is COVID is sure. a great accelerator. And it's so intriguing. So we found two great articles, one from Forbes, one from Market Watch, where they're just putting specific issues, stats, industries. We've been talking about it on the podcast around housing, obviously, <clears throat> since we're right. real estate specific. But I, I actually, it's very intriguing to read these because it's one of the articles is subtitled that's the great accelerator. Well, not really, meaning things were happening already. Well, it's kind of been interesting because it's a it's it's a back and forth on it, but it, it things trends were already happening in all sectors, all industries that we're gonna talk about here. It's just that things happen faster. Things that might have taken five years to get to the level that they're at now happened in months, within months, because of because of massive changes in the economy employment and consumer behavior, bottom line, period, right. end of story. People figure out, we all survive, we figure out how to adapt. Those that survive, survive. 
people. Unfortunately, there's a percentage of folks and it's going to continue to rise. We don't know what it's going to be, but there's no avoiding right now the deaths. The death count's going to continue to tally until there's enough uh, enough of um, immunity from everyone, whether it's through just the herd immunity of people spreading it around to the actual, it's going to take months into next year before people are vaccinated. And then you got people who don't want to be vaccinated. Right. So there you go. We're stuck with all this. And meanwhile, things things change. So we have a little thing on consumer behavior and there's a, it's from the Forbes article. Uh, and it's just a quick um, snapshot of U.S. consumer behavior. And so, you know, it just it's through surveys and so forth. Fifty eight percent are spending more money online. Absolutely. Right. What else stood out for you when you were doing your research on, you know, you know, uh, people were using 58 percent more ordering restaurant takeout. That's well, it's also your entertainment. Your entertainment is all online now because you can't go practically anywhere to do entertain, you know, to, to find entertainment. So I think those that that I, when I was kind of looking around and, and, and these aren't. Uh, you know, oh my God, eye popping stats, really, because we all know it because we're all experiencing it. But it's really interesting to see. And what will be really actually fascinating, I think, you know, come let a couple months really go by when they can really, really do 20 real hard 2020 stats um, to see how things have done over the uh, span of the entire year versus prior years. I think it's going to be really interesting. You know, a couple things are interesting. Thirty-eight percent are buying more groceries online. I never bought groceries. I still haven't bought groceries online. But that—that that I think is interesting. That that's will that continue? These are the things. To your point, will it continue? Right. You know. So we'll, we'll get into some more of these here. So uh, we have a couple charts. If you're into the stats and on the economy, just showing GDP and all the things that have happened there, and then unemployment. So there's a great unemployment. You know, just kind of showing where we were at the end last quarter of of. Um, 19 moving into the first quarter of 2020 and we were like at what three and a half that's right three and a half percent unemployment rate then march it ticks up to 4.4 then it goes to 14.7 percent nationally then it's steadily you know jobs have recovered but we're still now from 3.5 going into the pandemic at six and a half 6.7 percent unemployment uh in the united states but in worse in certain places like in nevada we're like at 13 percent so it's just varies in where you are. But recovery, you know, recovery seems to be a theme here, but there's still a lot of that people hurt with jobs and so forth. So it brings it to housing, you know, in the housing market. Um, I do a market report every month and record it uh, for Nevada, but I also talk about the, the, the national housing statistics that I get from Keeping Current Matters, uh -huh. which is a highly recommend Keeping Current Matters if you um, are a real estate person, professional, and you want to stay on top of it. So we have a couple charts to share, and one of them just really shows the dip, right? So the first one I'm showing is a huge V, and it's just a recovery index. They look at demand, supply, price, and time on the market, and there's a red line here that goes from <laughs> March through uh, May, and that is where we basically saw the shutdown. You know, right. this is quarantine, people in lockdown. And then it just was that was unknown. It was that huge unknown, and no one knew exactly what was going to be going on. So so. Look at how amazing quickly it recovered. It almost recovered sure. as fast as it dropped. Absolutely. So did. we've had nothing but upward tick, a little slight downturn. But as far as this one index, everything is good in the housing market. And the next chart that we have shows why, and it's because of inventory. Mm -hmm. Inventory, incredibly low inventory across the country, coupled with a pent up demand, buyer demand. So you don't have enough houses. There's a lot of people that want to buy. Plus, less than 3% interest rate, create the perfect storm for house prices to continue to climb. Now, they can't keep up at this rate. That'll be a problem. You know, so our my prediction and anybody else that's, you know, I'm not an economist, but looking at all of that at some point, it, it, it should steady out a little bit. But for right now, as long as there's not enough inventory and people don't put their homes on the market because they don't know where they're going to go, they're that's staying right. at home. So it's just a whole bunch of things causing that to happen. Right it's now. interesting. I don't know if you've experienced this, but we have a, a, a lot of people, either friends or people that we have known through other people who have jumped onto the whole selling the house thing because they wanted to, you know, they just felt as though they were going to be able to get a good price for their home, which they have, right? Uh, but now they're in the quandary because it was it was, yeah, it wasn't the intentional, like the planned, let's move, we're going to retire, we're going to do whatever, you know, it's like now they're without a home. So a lot of these people that we have, uh, that we are, you know, talking to are now renting. It's just, yeah. it's an interesting scenario. Well, uh, that's interesting. I know several people, same thing. If the, if the market's going to shift in the next year or so, then maybe get out on the top of the market, rent for a little while and wait and see if prices come down, then go buy. That is a philosophy a lot of people are following. So we'll yeah. see what happens. 
Anyway, it, yeah, it's all a matter of if that's going to play out or not, because there's a lot, still a lot of unknowns that are happening. Now, there are two other things that are going to impact the housing industry. And I think how they impact housing overall and could impact homelessness um, and just yeah. people being displaced is the tenant eviction moratorium, which is part of this bill that the second um, you know, stimulus right. COVID-19 relief bill, we'll see what happens. But with the new administration, I personally feel, you know, with what happened in 2008, we're not, go U.S. is not going to let people get, you know, they're going to figure something out. They're going to have to bail out the landlords. You know, people aren't paying their rent or their mortgages. That can't continue. But the people who have the mortgages need to be made whole too. So we'll see how this all goes out. But there's a couple charts in here to show how many people haven't been paying their rent. Um, you know, a lot of people have gotten got caught up on this, but there is a percentage of people who are at risk if the moratorium for evictions is, is lifted. And I kind of feel to your point there, your point on that, Jan, is I think that, that it, it will probably all, all work out, you know, in the end, as far as some legislation that goes through. I think it's going to be a lot more noise than it is actual things not happening. Because but, it's, but it's, there will be people, because there's folks that are not paying their rent, that maybe oh, could be paying sure. their rent. And so sure. what's going to happen is, in my opinion, is it, it's going to get to your point worked out, but there will be people that are displaced. But I think what we're going to start seeing is more people finding roommates, living together, um, figuring that out. But if it, you know, so we'll see what happens. And same with mortgage forbearance. We have a chart that shows at the peak of the shutdown, when the CARES Act rolled out and that there were these two things were in the national, you know, mind and, and rules and so forth. There were like 4.78 million more people with mortgages that took, you know, took up, got some kind of forbearance. Well, that's dropped down to 2.79. But if you go to the next chart, 2.79, <clears throat> this is a good chart. And this was just as of last month, I think. So there are, uh, out of all the people that are still in a forbearance, so when you look at all the forbearances, rather, 54.6% were paid in full, which means a lot of people just sold their house. That's yep. really, I mean, they didn't go pay it off. They sold their house. Therefore, their mortgage is paid off. 30.7% worked out a repayment plan. There's 14, almost 15% of people as of about a month or so ago that are still in trouble, meaning they're still behind in their payments. This is for mortgages now. They're trying to work something out. And um, so those, if they're not cured or they're not worked out, could become future distressed properties if they eat up all their equity. Okay. Right. There's but a, still a whole different, different picture than we've seen in the past. So, you know, it's yeah. a, you know. So it keeps getting better. And then, of course, I think with government plans and so forth, it will, we'll, we'll see what happens. So where people are screaming, if you go online and like housing crash 2021 is coming, it's yeah. because people think that all of a sudden all these houses are going to come glutton on the market. I, You know what? We're going to have to wait and see because if a ton of houses come on the market because tenants are displaced and investors want to get rid of their properties and there's all these houses that go back to the banks, yeah, there's going to be a problem, but I don't see that happening. The other thing that's happening that we need to take a look at is the migration to the suburbs. That is real. And in real estate, we'll talk about it in the new year and keep following the trends. But this is people don't want to stay in the city. I mean, New York, New York, Matt, do you know people in New York? They, people don't want to stay. People are leaving New York and Chicago and heading to places like Florida. No, to absolutely Florida. When I was down there over the summertime, they were already happening. I mean, that was a huge bit of the news almost every single day that there were absolutely no houses to be sold because people were snatching them from up north. So, uh, yep. yeah, that played a big, huge part they of wanna, it. You know, people want more in a house. If they're going to be working from home, that's the next topic. There's been more companies, more people adapting to work from home. I think that trend will continue. It's going to be an interesting to see what happens with businesses and bricks and mortar and commercial real estate because- yep, yep. If people can go for a year and a half, two years and companies figuring out how to be efficient and work from home and still get productivity and stuff done, we'll see what happens, right? Yeah. So those are things that are forever changed. Now that was already happening. Companies already had work from home. It's just higher levels of it now and faster. And so it'd be intriguing to see what happens. So you know what's interesting uh, about working from home, I think is the a lot of the tech companies, like that big, huge Apple campus that was built built up in Northern Cal, that big, beautiful, you know, uh, bigger what than uh, Pentagon. Yeah, beautiful thing. I'm just wondering, you know, because it was like, bring everyone here, make this a great campus. Uh, okay. So it's so when, intriguing. I can't wait to fast forward. I don't want to have time go by quickly, but it'll be fun in a couple of years to look back on this, like what we're recording today and just see, wow, what, what do we get right? What changed? 
what else? I knew it's going to lead that. It's so funny because we've worked with a lot of people, just you and I personally, Jan, uh, or I've talked about this quite a bit of, of bosses who do not like people work from home because you don't have that accountability or that, you know, watching over someone every single minute. This is a situation where, you know, um, the uh, employees uh, and the popularity of and everything and and the, the amount of work that get done might actually lead that. And some of these people that are a little bit behind in their thinking or older in their uh, their uh, their thinking mm -hmm. have to really adapt or they're going to find themselves in a bad place. It's very intriguing. Adaption is a key word here. Now, we're just talking about impacts of COVID-19 right now. So let's keep moving on because we have a couple other major stories to talk about. Uh, and then, uh, uh, the major story number two is the U.S. election. Oh, right? boy. Yeah. You mean the election that went on for, well, well the, <laughs> election the, election the, election before the actual day itself. And then, oh, the tabulation went on a whole nother week. So what? I guess January 20th, we'll really know what the story is. <laughs> Okay. Oh, wait a minute. What am I saying? It's not over yet. What are we saying? It's not, you know, my goodness. Oh my great. gosh. It's been the most tumultuous year in, from the pandemic to this, the, to the politics of things has just been crazy. So yeah. we do have a little shot here of the electoral college, uh, the results, which is how it's been in electoral college. And as we record this, we're still waiting for the the mostly ceremonial reading of it by the vice president of the United, current vice president of the United States, which is gonna occur on January 5th. Six. Um, and and I love it because I love seeing these clips of where like it was Biden who last time had to declare Trump the mm -hmm. the winner and that, you know, when, it, when Trump won because we had a free and fair election, unless you believe the, you know, the, it was influenced by the Russian interference, but whatever, they don't seem to be talking about that anymore because now it's all about he loses. So now we're going to have to talk about, you know, why it didn't work out right. But the bottom line is we'll see uh, January 20th when we, if Joe Biden is literally in the white house on the 20th, then we know everything worked. That's right. But, but getting back to the whole COVID situation, many candidates, let's, you know, we're, we're going to try not to show our colors too much blue that, um, uh, you know, it changed the week. <laughs> All I'm saying is I want to see Mike Pence read the oh, no, I don't say it. I don't or we're going to see if it turns into yet another bipartisan. I don't care what side of the fence you're on. Yeah. Um, it, it is what it is. That, I'm, I'm just making a statement of what has happened. And it's been yeah, nothing it but tearing it. down and tearing apart of America this it year. It will turn into a into a, a, a show like uh, so much of their other stuff. It'll be fascinating. But you know what the cool thing about this is, you know, when do you ever see or hear about the electoral uh, uh college uh, nominees or the you know, people chosen voting. I mean, you never hear about that. It just happened. I know, that's my whole point. Nobody even knows about that. It's like, right. now that's to the forefront because of this very contentious bipartisan, I mean, uh, you know, partisan year where everybody's just polarized. And it's just the way it is. We're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, it is really interesting. A lot of the ways people actually did campaign uh, changed during the pandemic. There were a lot of drive-in rallies. There were people who did a lot of Zoom calls. There wasn't that, you know, mom and pap go down to the, the local mm -hmm. cafe and have pancakes with people because you were socially distancing for the most part. I mean, you know, it was all over the, the board. But, you know, for really, you know what I mean? When we talk about people really breaking the rules, it is a smaller group of people. It's not the majority of people out there not doing the yeah. right thing. So, um, but anyway, so that changed the way that they, the, um, the campaign went along, all the different campaigns. What was most fascinating, I think, about this election, and a lot of it has to do with just the the division of the country, but it was, at, by a landslide, the the more people voted this year than have ever voted in, that year, you know, in the presidential election. I mean, my goodness gracious, both of these candidates, the winner of the election and the loser of the election, both got more votes than any other presidential candidate had that ever That is a powerful been. statement. And I hope it continues. That was a good news there. More people interested in getting out and, and using their vote because it is well, discouraging every every. Yeah, uh, and, and every honestly, week. let's just be realistic about that. You know, as the country gets larger and larger, and there's 340 million people in the United States, for you know, it is just easier if you have more time to vote and you don't have to go to a polling place to vote. It's easier. Colorado is a great example of that. They've had vote by mail for the entire state. Everyone in that state gets a mail ballot. They've been doing that for years. Yeah. It's working out just fine, and they have a higher percent of voters that actually vote because it's easier to actually vote. Let's make it easier to vote uh, people, not harder. So, you know, that's all great. But I love the story about Georgia right now. The runoff election for those two Senate seats, they've already had more votes cast in this runoff election than they had in the general election. Now, that is unbelievable for a January um, election. 
You know, to turn to count these votes because I'm sure we have to count them five times. So. Well, that's true. That <laughs> we'll will, I, no doubt be counted multiple times, you know. Well, let's just say if one side wins, we only have to count it once. If the <laughs> other side wins, we'll be counting them three to five times. Okay. I'm not too so uh, moving on, yeah. uh, everybody knows and you are where you stand. Um, the next big story, of course, was uh, systemic racism kind of unfolding and showing up in the Black Lives Matter movement. And, right. Uh, and we've got some really great uh, links to some articles and some charts that just really show the disparity between races in the country um, on all fronts, from yeah. job positions to schooling to a bit, you know, just whatever, you know, from people's polls and opinions and, and so on, um, to the, you know, the reality and uh, of how the black population is definitely has a higher instance of being targeted and so forth. It's just it's, there are bad apples that are out there. Um, but the problem in the with the police, and, and I have a family that are police, is that yeah. it's the rooting out of the bad apples. It's letting those guys stay in. It's not the entire police departments across the country that are racist. No way. But there is definitely stuff in just this one area that we're talking about at the moment that just continues on. And so, what came to forefront with the with the with the which with the rallies and the um, the protests rather. Um, throughout the year, which was interesting, was a mixture of people and a lot of young people involved. There was a yeah. lot of young people that were out there of all races trying to speak up and say, let's figure this out. Very it, was, interesting. It, was, it, it actually was a very reassuring time for me anyway, just to kind of see who actually did participate in those rallies. You know, the, the rhetoric and the noise around it and the people protesting against, you know, that's all fine and good, whatever. Everyone has the right to do and think and believe whatever they want to believe, right? But I think that especially for white Americans, uh, and I know I feel this way, if you were really introspective and you really looked into yourself and really asked yourself some questions about the way you perceive race, even though, you know, you would absolutely say like everybody does, I'm not a racist, you know, if you really get in there and you really uh, dig into it, there are things you can find out about yourself that you might be like, hmm. Yeah, you know, I never really thought about it that way. It's a really putting yourself in someone else's shoes, right? It's walking in their shoes and really understanding the path and the and and where people have been in their their lives. It's about in our people. genetics and the way we've all been raised and from generations back. And I wish I could, I could probably find it. It's something that Brene Brown did um, back after the Charlotte disaster. There, you know, that whole. Yep. Um, thing where the car ran into people and she did something on Facebook live where she was just talking about white privilege, which when, even if you say racism or you say black lives matter, you say white privilege, people just get stuff around it. Right. Uh -huh. Like, Ooh, that's not, you know, but anyway, it was very enlightening and I can probably find it cause it's probably still on her Facebook feed. Um, very enlightening just to listen to her say, this is what to her white privilege means. And you're like, all of a sudden you see yourself, if you're white and you're listening to. Yeah, you see, that's you what I mean. It's, a it, I may have had that thought and then does that mean course. this? So anyways, to your point, introspection on this is, it's not about a label, it's a deeper than that. It's about really looking at our history, frankly. Right, absolutely. <laughs> all right, wait, so we're, we're to no, story number four, climate. These are our major stories. Oh boy, I'm telling you, you know, the world was on fire. Or the, the, actually, literally, the world was on fire uh, this year. In the United States alone, 63, excuse me, 53,000 individual fires were burning throughout 2020 across the United States, mostly in the West, but not all in the West. There were a lot of fires down in Florida, actually. Um, they, they had a rather uh, uh, droughty year down there in Florida. Uh, but in the West, oh my stars, the fires have been horrible. And, you know, we were pretty lucky here in Southern California, or excuse me, in the Orange County area, pretty lucky until, you know, the last couple of months when all of a sudden the Santa Ana winds would kick up and, and there they'd fly again. 95 million acres burned across the United wow. States in 2020. Uh, so fires, you know, they will continue to be bad. You know, yeah, we need to add to this list because honestly, Australia was a horrible story. I was going to say, absolutely. Yeah. It's not yeah. just a, uh, a United States phenomenon, you know, the uh, yeah. global the worst um, fire seasons for those guys. And I don't know how many millions of acres burned and all the animals displaced and people and so forth. And that's the thing. That's the thing, you know, I mean, th this is climate change, people. And, uh, you know, you can talk about how you can you know, make this to where places aren't as susceptible to fire. Um, uh, you know, that's all a fine and good conversation. But uh, climate is what's uh, changing this this whole thing. Hurricanes, another huge thing. We had 31 named storms in 2020. I mean, that's kind of crazy. Um, 
So, so, so many, you know, you run through the alphabet and then you go into the Greek alphabet. I know, that was wild when they started using the Greek uh, letters. Right, we got all the way up to Iota uh, was the was the, the last storm, um, which I thought was interesting. That has only happened one other time wow. since they started actually naming storms in the mid 1900s. So that's, that's absolutely crazy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, I remember back at the beginning of the storm, my, my, you know, my, my mother lives down in Florida, so I'm always very hypersensitive and use the Wink weather app. Wanted to get that in there. For I definitely everybody. use it still. <laughs> um, uh, watching storms and kind of see what people are predicting, you know, what the weather service is predicting for the upcoming storm season. They were saying that it was going to be a very active year, but they also said it was going to be a very dangerous year. Uh, that was a prediction. There was only one Cat 5 storm actually that actually made landfall this year, and that was the very last one, Iota, and that wasn't even a United States States landfall that was into Central America. So it's how that can line up and it can be hor devastating to uh, human life and, and property. And then it can just be a lot of them and not as devastating. It's weird. Yeah, it, it, a lot of flooding. And the area that was hit the worst, it seems, in the U.S. was that whole Louisiana um, Gulf Coast oh. region. Totally. The the Gulf was hit all, all year long. You know, speaking of climate, you know, we have a chart here that we're going to also put into our show notes. It just shows that, that you know, there were so many environmental laws that were put into place during prior administrations and the current administration, because they were doing everything they possibly could. And you know what? You can be for this or against this. I, you know, like I said, as always, you, you know, everyone gets the right their own opinion. Uh, and it was not really so much about necessarily ruining the environment. Uh, it was about, you know, lowering restrictions and uh, things in place so businesses could actually do more and 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 it could be lean more toward business but there were so many of the environmental uh uh measures and restrictions put into place that were rolled back during the current administration i think all all in all and this goes from air pollution and emissions into water pollution um and infrastructure uh, everything that you can think of that had to do with the environment uh there uh, 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 84 different things wow. were rolled back during the, the I never saw this in a chart like this. Wow. Right. And it really kind of really points to the fact that we now, I mean, it's taking, you, you don't just flip a switch with climate. Hey, I'm a California boy and I grew up in the Bay area. Air pollution was horrible when I was growing up in the seventies. It was the number one topic. As a matter of fact, I, and everything, you know, you know, um, Pollution was a big deal back then, right? You had a Hootie the Owl that was your mascot that was teaching you to to to, to uh, recycle and to, and to conserve. Uh, it's taken us a long time to get our air quality good in this com uh, country. Years, decades. It's actually. only due to you know making sure that right. and, and it doesn't just happen overnight. You know, it's with emissions. It's with a lot of the other controls that are put on. Now. With that said, rolling back these things, if we can reverse a lot of these things and get these things back into place, we might still be able to give us, give ourselves a couple more years because it's not going to immediately get horrible again. But I'm telling you, if we don't get some of these things back into place, and thankfully in California, the state overrode a lot of these things in their own state and, you know, um, especially emission controls uh, for cars uh, to keep the air, air clean and, and wow breathable but uh, amazing you know what things can do and it might be all fine and good now because the people are saying yeah this is great this is boosting business well that's all fine and good but <laughs> but 20 well, you you the piper now, later, your grandkids yeah. your kids are going to pay the pipe for business you, you know short-term thinking can is always a very <laughs> problematic uh, uh yeah. problematic thing so anyway moving on yeah. the, the re so those were our top four stories right the pandemic the uh the election the um uh Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, racism uh, coming to the forefront, and um, climate change. And right. so we just wanted to touch on a couple other things. We have some articles in here for you, too, on just what was the, how did it impact different industries and adaptions and, you know, positive stories of how people adapted or companies or businesses adapted. And it starts with streaming services. Obviously, that came to the forefront. You better believe Nobody it. Nobody could go to the movies. And so... What did you find out in your research? I mean, my gosh, that's the big three right now, right? Netflix yep. and Netflix, Amazon Disney Prime Plus. Plus. I mean, Disney Plus, you know, jumped in that first month. What was it like 80 million or something crazy? There was some sort of crazy. Well, they had some timing on that, didn't they? Disney yeah. Plus. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> when did that launch? It launched last November or was it December? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
absolutely amazing. I, you know, Netflix still is the uh, the the king of uh, streaming yeah. services, but it is interesting that really people are more and more and more. And once again, we talked about the accelerator of of COVID. You know, are starting to veer away from network television, you know, or cable television onto streaming service platforms. How many how many do you subscribe to, Jan? Uh, well, I think I, I have Hulu. I have the Hulu Disney Plus package. I have Netflix. I have Prime Video right now. Those are the ones I have. Yeah, that's where we are too. We have HBO still on our cable because we still have cable. You still have cable? Yeah. Are you on cable? No, I know premium channels on not like HBO. But, you know, to, to that point, HBO Max. Now, what I love, you're about to talk about the movie industry and yeah. the top list is, but. I like how they adapted. So uh, the, the one that's to my forefront right now, because I think it opens Christmas Day, is Wonder Woman 80, 8, 1984, which I'm super excited to see. I hope I can see. But you can only see it on HBO Max. Right. So think of the deals that are being cut with the movie, uh, the studios, with um, these streaming services to be very lucrative, because everybody will want to go watch that. I'll tell you, I appreciate Disney because, you know, Disney, usually <laughs> the company that's always out looking looking to make a buck, they've done some first, you know, immediate release right to Disney Plus. As a matter of fact, the new animated fig, uh, feature Soul, uh, which looks like it's going to be an amazing uh, 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 movie, is going to premiere on Disney Plus. No additional charge. On they didn't the, do that initially. I can't think of what, what it was. They, they they rolled something out for 20 bucks. It was a very short amount of time, and then they then they brought it live. Right, and I think that that they they learned very quickly that that's just going to have to be the thing until we figure out what the new normal is going to be yeah. for going to the movies again when movie theaters begin to open back up again. I don't know; it's hard to predict what that's going to be because I think people are getting much more used to, even though they already were. I mean, for granted, we've been been binge watching things forever. Yeah, uh, but think about what else. Uh, uh, Peacock is another example. Prime, yeah. uh, NBC goes to a streaming service, and I just think this is where it's going to go. Does it mean it's the end of network TV? I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. And I, I think that, yeah, because at some point, you know, there can't be 50 of these channels because they're going to be, well, I take that back. Never say never because everyone will just start buying everyone else up. So that's, be that's exactly what you just took the result. <laughs> that, that is exactly well, Hamilton has had the most watched on demand. Oh my God, I've watched that. I personally have probably <laughs> added on <laughs> I was going to say that is actually because of Jennifer. Right? <laughs> because every time she watches it, it counts as a new one. <laughs> Let me see how many of these I've watched. Uh, so we've got Borat too. I started watching that. I can't. I can't handle that. I, I stopped watching it too. That's funny. Yeah. You should do that because I, I don't. I don't. I'm not into it. Um, Extraction. I did see that. Phineas and Ferb on Disney did not. Mulan. Oh my god! I totally watched the live Mulan. It was awesome. Was it good? I, I haven't seen that. Really good. The Old Guard, The Trial of Chicago 7, I haven't seen that. The Witches, oh, that's new. Oh, oh Mulan it. actually Jam, was the one you were talking about. Mulan's the one that they actually brought out as a charge. Ah, and that's exactly right. Mulan, yeah. right? The Lovebirds, yeah. Rebecca, Project Power. And, oh, Enola Holmes high, gets high marks for me. Um, and I don't, that's, that's just the ones I've watched. Yeah, no, it's it. So we have a, a list here that, of the top uh, 30 movies. Oh, there, uh, yeah. And you're going to see that, you know, Netflix is, is probably the winner here at Disney Plus, though. My goodness gracious, they uh, came onto the scene and were a um, a force to be reckoned with. As a matter of fact, Disney just had its shareholders meeting just last week, I believe it was, maybe it was the week before last. And because their theme parks, unfortunately, have, have had a pretty bad year, considering Disneyland has been closed now for, gosh, since March uh, 17th or 16th, I think it was. Um, uh, so the theme park division is is very, very low, but their streaming services, obviously, uh, what they're doing the focus on. And oh my gosh, I don't know if you heard, you read this article or you heard about this, Jam, but the 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 slate of, of offerings that's going to be coming out on Disney Plus over the next year, year and a half, is going to be absolutely amazing. Wow. So many things in the Star Wars universe. An incredible lineup in the Marvel uh, universe as well, not to mention just regular shorts and everything. And Disney did announce they're having a dollar increase Increase in their subscription price coming up in March. So you're going to get you know, that. and already, well, they saw net. They probably watched what Netflix. Netflix sure. went up, and yep. I, I, you know, it's interesting. You know, they they got higher increase in subscriptions, and they're pushing the issue, and people aren't going to cancel. I think some they probably lost people, but whatever they got. That, I mean, when you think about the millions, it went up three or two or three or four dollars. How much more money that's bringing in? It's nuts when you think about it. Yeah, it allows them to if, go it on, if it was at one dollar, <laughs> they're making an additional one hundred and sixty million dollars a month for crying out. Come on, it's crazy. Um, HBO Max is the new one onto the scene here, and they're already jumped in. So, finishing up here, stock market crazy, right? I mean, ups and downs, but overall, hello, it's finished up. So, as of uh, the latest that we pulled this December twentieth, 
The S&P 500 is up 15% this year to 3709 after rising, you know, just another 1.3% uh, the week before with Tesla just um, uh, isn't even coming out. Tesla hasn't even, I guess, joined the S&P right. 500, which is interesting to watch that. But I'm not into the stock market as much as I'd like to be. No, because remember, and, well, the stock market doesn't is not a reflection of the economy, as our good friend Stephanie Rule tells us every day. On honestly, the one arc, one thing that you've pulled up here is that what's the percentage of that's automated? These things are automated. The way the stocks go up and down is is dependent on on things that happen, obviously. Um, but I, I find it intriguing. But there's a couple of great articles in here. One from Yahoo Finance and from Barron's right. about an overall view of what happened with the stock market in 2020. So if you own stocks, you're in pretty good shape, right? Absolutely. Uh, maybe, and then if you own the right stocks, as it always is around tech and and Zoom and these other things, um, and some of these other things we're going to talk about online shopping. This is crazy. I mean, I don't, I, you have, I have not ever, I don't really like to buy clothes online. Uh, I haven't figured that one out yet. That would be the only thing. Everything else, Amazon. Sure. I've done a ton of online shopping this year, but not for clothes. How about you? Oh yeah. We, I've always been a, uh, I, I, I don't mind your size. Yeah. My, I'm pretty easy to fit. <laughs> I'm pretty normal size. So I don't really mind doing that. Plus, I'll tell you, Amazon especially, the return process is so easy. Yeah, then you can go you to Kohl's right now and return. Yeah, that is fantastic, right? I've actually done that one. So online shopping predicted to hit $4 trillion in 2020. Yikes. Yep. Um, we're expected to have, in the U.S. alone, we're expected to have 300 million online shoppers in 2023. That's 91% of the entire country's population. So crazy that's only going to continue it already was now it is interesting how that really how you know how it has affected the united states post office uh, service too now amazon obviously has their own delivery service you know their amazon trucks going around but a lot of these other uh companies that are delivering through the mail it has really affected not only did the election uh put the post office into a tailspin because some of the things and hijinks, I might add, were done uh, around that, but has really messed up the holiday season. I, there's a couple presents I'm still waiting for that were yeah. supposed to be to me weeks ago. One of them, as a matter of fact, for you, Jenna Brian, uh, <laughs> that is still floating around. I, I, I found on my delivery. I'm yeah. going to track it. It's like it's on its way. And then I do go farther into the track. I'm like, why is that in New Mexico? It should be here. It should have been here two weeks ago. Well, so. well, that, but you know, overall, not bad for the high increase. And then, of course, the next big thing is just the increase in delivery and pickup services, not just for groceries, but for people just going to Target or wherever. I mean, every store I go to now, of course, has the area that you go, even in fast food restaurants yep. or regular restaurants, an area that you can come for pickup. You can, you know, so the adapt the adaption of that is amazing to me, uh, of the restaurant and the grocery business and just retail businesses adapting to, you don't have to come into the store. You can go online, you can download our app. And just how many just individual uh, businesses actually do delivery now? I mean, really, it harkens back to when we were very, very young, or actually even a little bit before our time when, you know, you get your milk delivered, the milkman would come. I mean, it's it's fascinating how customer service has really, really changed. In a lot of ways, this really is so much more convenient, right, than actually take, calling yourself out and going to multiple stores or going to one store and, you know, doing your shopping. So it, it will be interesting to see how this changes. From the Starbucks to like it or not like it, the Chick-fil-A does deserves a the people at Chick-fil-A workers deserve a in my opinion attaboy for the way they constructed traffic in their 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 place. Well and and in and out, same thing, okay. right? They're they always just, crazy. They figured it out. It was super efficient. Numerous people coming outside to be able to take your order. Right. Long lines that used to be long lines were they figured out. There's a couple examples of how they figured it out. And I didn't I did at Starbucks, frankly only recently started bringing people outside, getting the orders and making things faster, but the drive through would go a lot quicker too. So I well, think yeah, that's of our Starbucks, there's a whole, all of the spots are curbside now. Yeah. Uh, so, you can't even park right in front anymore. So there's a spot for the DoorDash people to come in. There's a spot for you to go in and, you know, exactly. have your stuff delivered to the car and then you can be in the drive through for numerous places, right? Speaking, yeah. of Door, speaking of DoorDash, did you know that DoorDash was the number one of... Uh, no food delivery. I didn't know that either. We're door dashers. We have dash pass. We've been door dashers way before the pandemic, actually. Um, and I'm not sure how we got turned on to door dash in there originally, but I was, it, it was interesting to me to find out that they were the number one delivery service. I always just assumed that Uber Eats was going to be, but actually it's not Uber Eats. Is number yeah, two. Or Grubhub, I would have or assumed. Grubhub. Basically four of them. I never really heard of Postmates till I started seeing Postmates signs 
in stores that said, you know, we deliver. Or, or you know what's funny? I don't play a lot of games on my computer, except for that one game that you 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 turned me on to years ago where you oh, do that, connecting the, the dots, the commercials that are on there, because I always, I'm not going to pay to have my ads not uh, on there. It's, you know, I'm not giving them any more money. But there was always a Postmates out on there. And I thought yeah. that was, that's what I found out about Postmates. We're week. looking at a chart about meal delivery, November 2020 share of sales. And I'm like, did, did DoorDash start in San Francisco? Because 69%. It did. Of, of deliveries, okay. Uh, of deliveries in San Francisco are DoorDash, then Grubhub, then Uber Eats, or no, Uber Eats, then Grubhub, then Postmates. Interesting. And that's a DoorDash is a, a IPO. It's got an IPO. Yep. And it's crazy, man. That, that's the example of adapting to a business. There's room for more than one. There's clearly four leaders in the meal delivery. And this one story alone is interesting because these guys figured it out and they created jobs. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the flip side of this. This all actually, it, 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 in a certain sense, it does help smaller uh, independent restaurants, but in another way, it kind of does not. And matter of fact, we have a restaurant right here in Anaheim Hills called Rosine's, best Mediterranean food you're going to get I ever, agree with that. Anywhere. Um, you know, they, of course, with DoorDasher, DoorDash has got to make their money, right? So they do get a little percentage of that uh, money that comes they, out. They, they have sales they might not have had. So exactly. They have that. But on the other hand, so they don't even do it. They don't do it because they refuse. It's almost like, hey, remember how the people didn't used to use American Express as one of their yeah, yeah, it costs more. fee, right? So if you really are wanting to help the local business in your neighborhood, you know, order your food and then go down and pick it up. Yeah, there you um, go. You know, that uh, you know, so in a way, you know, I'm I'm all for home delivery. Uh, but at the same time, you we need to help your the small. Well, that brings people. up the next thing, and it's the small sure business does. that have declined. So we've got yeah, you know, this is from September, and there's a link to the Yelp uh, Economic Average dot com, which they have uh, business closures as of September that took their postings down from from Yelp. Sixty percent of business closures due to the coronavirus are now permanent, according to the Yelp data. Have reached uh, you know, ninety seven nine sixty six. Uh, small businesses, uh, you know, just not making their business businesses right. that won't help. Okay. Hey, we're, we're very familiar with that because we were a part of a small business that closed in uh, uh, during the pandemic. So we are one of that. We're, we're in that stat. So Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting. You know, so there's things closed, but again, where did those people, did some people go figure out and the innovators are the ones that have adjusted or they went to a different industry and that's what's going to be happening in the, in the continuing into the new year. And then schools, I know, you know, you're, your wife, Laura, is a fourth grade school teacher, and she certainly had to go through a whole bunch. I have a net. My niece is a first year sixth grade school teacher, and she did the whole thing, too, and had her first. Can you imagine being your first year teaching and you had to deal with remote learning and sometimes your kids are in the classroom? She's in Utah. What's the big takeaways there for schools? And I guess we don't really know the impact for the kids yet. We don't know the impact, but we know the, I, I do the, I know the impact on teachers because I live with one, right? You know what I mean? And, and, you know, most schools across the nation still are not open. I mean, that's just the way it is, or some of them are open and have immediately closed. Uh, the district that my wife works in is open right now and it is unnerving and everybody is unnerved. The teachers are unnerved. The staff is unnerved. The, uh, the parents and the, you know, everyone's got their opinion of what things, you know, should happen. I, I personally believe that schools should be closed until we figure this whole thing out um, because it's not safe. Um, but that's my opinion. That's not the opinion of everybody. And um, we'll see what happens as time goes on. And thank God there's a vaccine that's me coming in. But, you know, especially if this new virus, this new strain of the virus starts really coming in and uh, uh, all of a sudden it spreads so much more easily. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just not a safe environment. You know, everyone needs to hunker down. I've been saying this since things started. You hunker down, we would have already been out of this. If we would have done what we're, we should have been doing back in March and April and May, right now we might be going to our family's house to actually celebrate Christmas. So, you know, don't get me on the soapbox on this. A lot of different opinions, but I'm telling you, it will be very interesting down the line to see how well, that. The implications of the social, the, the social factors for kids, which leads to mental health. And we have a couple articles to, you know, who World Health Organization, CDC, just on um, coping, managing and impact, the mental health impact of, of this. And people, some people did well in isolation, others didn't, you know. Right. Um, some people got more creative, others had a hard time not being able to be social. Yeah, well, this time, the holiday, we're always, uh, always a hard time for a lot of people. So, yeah. you know, not coupled with everything else going on, you know, I, I'm sure that we're going to have some interesting statistics. Well, one of the adapter ways for people to still stay social is the popularity of the Zooms and the Google Meets. Online meetings. Last year, this time, who heard of Zoom? I mean, I'd heard of Zoom, but nobody used it. As Not much. very many people. And now Zoom is on everybody's lips, right? And frankly, I've used Google Meet with a couple of clients and it works just as easy. Um, it's awesome. So 
So what are some stats here? Zoom? Well, it's just interesting, you know, just that, you know, it, very few companies only use one platform. 80% of businesses with over 250 employee, employees are likely to use video calling tools, which I think is fantastic, right? There was one stat on here. Let me find it here. How they use up to three. Oh, yeah. 62% of companies use three or more video comfort calling platforms, which I'm sure is quite uh, confusing when people get on there because they're all similar but not exactly the same as Jen and I always find out more on different platforms. Um, uh, you know, you got two bees on there, Zoom and Google Meet. Google Meet yeah, Google Microsoft Team. Zoom. I know a lot of businesses that, you know, people I've talked to are, are, use that as well. That. Zoom had over 300 million meeting participants per day in 2020. That's amazing. Uh, that's just, that just shows you, and people got used to it. It's gonna continue on. Microsoft Teams was another one that emerged. Another uh, uh, little, uh, GIF I've, I've saw on uh, Facebook a lot or on social media a lot. Oh, I know what you're going to say. The quote of the year. Uh -huh. You're on you're mute. On mute. <laughs> That's funny. You sent that to me and I laugh because I don't know how many times I've said that. Uh, you're yeah, on right. mute. Exactly. Oh, that's classic. That is that's like one of those fun things that you remember. We we talked about the businesses, um, small businesses and retails. Anything key there? There we go. Let's let's finish yeah, up talking about sports. Sports are the maybe where we ended this out. Yeah, um, you know, obviously, I'm into music, and so I streaming. But a couple things that were highlights for me is there's an article, and I I was following uh, Melissa Etheridge. Melissa Etheridge in the beginning of the pandemic started doing live streams from home, concerts from home. She went 58 straight days of just having a concert. It was like three o'clock um, Pacific time every day. And she's got a huge fan club and so forth. And I just saw it on, it would pop up on Facebook as an alert. And I was like, why not? She's just doing like, it could be 20 minutes, 30 minutes of just songs. And it just got better and better and better and better. And then unfortunately her son passed away from opioid um, addiction, you know, related issue. And she stopped um, and she kind of, you know, grieved and went away. And then she came back, you know, a month or so later and all of a sudden unveiled a subscription service. So talk about an artist who figured out giving back, giving back. She's like, we're going to do this as long as we're in lockdown and, from California, it was brilliant because here she is giving back. A lot of uh, artists did this. A lot of different things kind of formed. So you saw they, you know, lost all their revenue. It's not just the person who's got all the money; it's their crew, sure. it's all their people that were unemployed. So she had things like, you know, go fund me for a crew and whatever. And so as of this article, she was making fifty grand a month on her subscription service. It was affordable if you wanted everything. It's like her and her wife are on five days a week. They're doing different things. They have a coffee chat where they're talking. And of course, this is behind the scenes with a celebrity or with an artist that's your favorite. And she would do her, she would do cover songs. She would do her old, her, you know, stuff from her library. And if you just wanted to go to her concert on Saturday, you could pay 10 bucks. You could right. still. Anyway, that's a really incredible story of adapting and figuring out how to do it. So um, we have some links to currently Billboard puts up who's doing live stream concerts. And yeah, then we have cool. a link to charts the best songs of the year i mean just just think about how uh television adapted during uh covid you know all the late night shows you know seth meyer oh, yeah, that's great uh, you know and uh, stephen I colbert know. you know and in a lot of ways i mean i almost enjoyed a lot of these these shows even better uh, you know without without everything going on it was just really interesting but they all stayed with it, it was great to watch everyone's hair let's talk about hair for a second oh everyone you know with their hair growing and and uh, uh beards for the guys i know exactly people that have beards that don't have beards and also broadway is another thing oh my god you know broadway is impacted right and you know we had tickets we were supposed to see uh the music man this last november and we had had those tickets a year in advance. Well, it got pushed until June of this year. And then it got pushed again until April of 2021, uh, 2022. So Broadway is uh, the show we're going to see is not going to be open until for a whole nother year in a couple months. So it's just crazy. And once again, the impact, not only just on um tour uh, you know broadway itself but it's tourism to new york it's it's all of the the restaurants and shops and everything around that you know it's just you know it's just a domino effect that happens not just with broadway but anything in your area when something closes down in entertainment you know sports the same oh way god. Oh, sports, man. oh my god right i mean same with vegas you know just having uh 50 less travelers coming in yep. 
means it's impacting just so many different jobs all the way down to the people that keep things clean in the hotel room and the, deliver, you know, food to the place. So yeah, crazy stuff. Right. So, but it's interesting to see how people have adapted. Um, Taylor Swift is another example of an artist who recorded two albums and dropped. Nobody does two albums in a year. Right. She did it through quarantine. And what they were doing was, um, you know, doing things remotely. People are in different areas and they're recording and they're doing things. And, and I just found that intriguing. And the, her first uh, thing came out several months ago called Folklore. It's very good. And then just like a week or two ago, she dropped a second album and just said, hey, we, while we were at it, we recorded another one. And here you go. Um, so very interesting how some people figure it out. People who have a different marketing mind um, in, the, right. in these industries do it. In sports, if you're a sports enthusiast like me, spectating, it was hard for a lot to not have any sports on, right? And then finally they figure out how to do it. I will give kudos to, you know, NHL and, and really NBA. They did the bubble. NBA thing. definitely, right. They did it in, well, they could do it easily because it was in the middle of the playoffs. And so they could, uh, or the playoffs were delayed and then they just decided to do it and they kept everybody in a bubble. But it was, you know, it means restrictions on family and travel. And, sure. Um, but but that was safe. They did it safely, right? And and so then, but it's just weird what we've adapted to now. If you follow sports, I mean, college football had different, everybody, every division handled it differently. They, my SEC only had uh, games in the SEC. They didn't do out of conference things. And so it's just weird, right? And it's weird to watch sports with nobody in the stands. I know. It it's just, there's a little, you have to get used to it for sure. We've gotten used to it. That's the point. In the beginning, it was like, this is so weird. But what was brilliant about how, they worked on things was crowd noise was it was put in okay. into the production um you know uh my my nephew was telling me that um for uh, maybe the detroit lions or somebody maybe a lot of them did this so if you wanted to get a cardboard cutout like if you were a season That's ticket holder, yeah. you could pay for a cardboard cutout of you being in your seat <laughs> so i'm just like okay Whatever. Interesting. Um, you know, some stadiums allowed a few people in most of them like here, the new stadium for the Raiders. Um, the owner is uh, Mark. What's his name? Uh, Davis is like, if I can't, you know, if we, nobody, if his fans can't come in then nobody can come in. Right. So that whole new stadium has been open. They've had home games and there's not been one person in the stadium where in other places they've allowed certain things. So obviously that was impacted, but we are sports enthusiasts. We got sports, we got it modified. Um, and we got used to not seeing anybody in stands. What are you going to do? Yeah. Like, and you know what, with everything, with the vaccine coming in and then, you know, we're not out of the, the dark winter yet, it'll be a while before everyone does it, but there is finally a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, I think. And that's what I think everyone's looking forward to. Well, you know this broadcast. Sorry, this, I stepped on you. This is our longest broadcast, but it's apropos that it will be the last one for 2020 is, uh, as we kind of recap our, our thoughts and, and impacts and how we, the year and the way we saw it, <laughs> right? right? In 2020, a lot of positive came out of a lot of negative in my view. Um, and it's just interesting to be a, be in the middle of, of what's happened historically to look back at, like I was mentioning a little bit ago, it'll be interesting to look several years from now back to this because we'll have come a long way and, but you never know. I mean, this is what's intriguing about the world and our lives is, Who's to say if something else doesn't come along that impacts us? But maybe we've learned and we can figure out how to do things better and adapt quicker. That's what. Yeah, that's and we probably haven't. So, um, I, you know, we have a lot of links, a lot of graphs, a lot of information in our show notes. So go over wbnlpodcast.com to uh, go in and get an easy, accessible link or mini links uh, to all of this info information. We have a lot of great stuff planned for 2021, don't we, Jan O'Brien? We're going to be a lot more active online, a lot more active in on YouTube uh, specifically. Specifically. And then we're going to be doing live things on our Facebook page as well. Coach, uh, coach tips every Monday, tech tips every Tuesday, Canva marketing tips every Wednesday, and then of course our WBNL podcast every Friday. If you are not a member of our Facebook group, please go over to Facebook and um, join our Oops, Yeah, it did come up. Yep, there we go. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook group. You can go to WBNL Coaching or WBNL Wanderers Club is the name of the group. We'll let you in and you can be a part of all of our live Facebook uh, presentations. If you're watching our replay on YouTube, don't forget, help us out, subscribe to the channel, turn on your notifications so you can know when we're start, starting to post more frequent, cool content on everything from how to run your real estate business and your teams, to tech tips, to marketing tips with Matt, uh, Canva right now. Oh my God, we learned some great things on Canva today. 
We're excited to continue to educate and inspire and motivate you in 2021 and beyond. That's right. So as always, everyone, get up, get out, mask up, be safe, everybody, and be forever wandering, but not lost. And Happy New Year. Thank you.